So when you play only repertoire from the score, how many correct ways are there through that repertoire? Right? How many correct ways are there through the Waldstein? There's only one. Play everything Beethoven wrote. It's the one correct way. And so it's like being on train tracks. There's, you have to be on tracks when you are a train. And if you get off the tracks, you have a terrible disaster. So what you're worried about in a train is a derailment. That, that's very, very bad if you get derailed. So don't. Uh, however, if you are wandering in the forest and you take a weird turn, that's not a problem, actually. In fact, it could be a great day because you have not set yourself up to need the rails. And so going off on the wrong path actually could be the best thing that happens all day. Now, you can't just wake up and do that without preparation. Uh, it took me really a couple of years of study and I very gradually introduced increasing levels of improvisation in front of other people because I like to be embarrassed in public about as much as you like to be embarrassed in public. Uh, so what I did, first of all, I was studying jazz. Uh, I took a couple summers and just, I, I didn't want to play the Gershwin preludes. I didn't want to play somebody's arrangement of Duke Ellington. I wanted to be able to improvise jazz like a real jazz player. So I studied it. And I studied the scales and the two five ones and the modal theory and I studied standards and charts. And I got to the point where I was adequate. Not worth buying a ticket for, but adequate. And during that process, I kept noticing ways that it resembled things going on in classical music. The first thing I noticed was playing a chart is variation form. Holy cow! If you play CJM Blues, or do you know what it means to miss New Orleans, or uh, all the things you are, you are looping on a form that has an established number of measures and certain harmonies that must happen in every measure. That's all it is. Well, that's the Goldberg variations, sort of. It's definitely all the Mozart variations and all the Handel variations, absolutely. So I said, what would happen if you took uh, uh, the, the Handel variations, which is actually the same as the Goldberg tune. And somewhere in the middle of those 16 or 20, you kept all the same measures and the same chords and the same tempo, but just made something up that fit. Would the police come through the door? You know, would, would faculty storm the stage and tackle you and drag you out and beat you to death behind the music building? You know, what, what will happen? Will anybody even know? And I found, what I found out is nobody even knows. They have no idea. Um, if you do it in, in the right style, you know, and the right, uh, just play it like it's real music and keep a straight face, nobody even knows. So that was my first experiment. And I, I went, oh my goodness. What did I just do? And I said, well, now let's play a game. <clears throat> I'm going to play this thing in concert, and I'm going to tell everybody, somewhere in the middle of this, it's not going to be Handel anymore. I'm going to start making it up for maybe two or three or four variations, and I want you to see if you can catch me. Okay? And, and I don't know, you can guess at the end, or you can raise your hand, I don't know, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> and that always worked, and, and what I found was they couldn't guess but they were very, very interested in listening. They, were, they became a better audience. They became a great audience. They put down their phones, and it was great. And then I said, okay, from there, why do I need handle at all? Why can't I just learn a chord progression and run it through about 10 variations and say, improvise variations? And uh, that worked. It was actually kind of fun. Um, and by the way, with handle, with a lot of his variations, each variation is one idea. This is one idea and one chord. So if you take uh, HWV 435, uh, first of all, it's rule of the octave. <laughs> okay, so this is pretty easy. It's this. And now it's not going to go all the way. It's going to turn around. 
that's all it is. Okay, the G major Chaconne, HWV 435, uh, as well as the variations HWV 442, 62 unbearable variations in G major. Uh, <laughs> it's too it's too darn long. Uh, but if you look at each of these variations, now each measure is a chord. G chord of the sixth on F sharp, sharp six on E, dominant chord, four two. Sixth, there's your six five, do a cadence, and you're done. Okay, now you need an idea. Okay, how about beep, bop, bop, beep, beep, bop, uh, like in little um, eighth notes? and put it in the left hand, that's two variations for the price of one. <laughs> and if you go through Handel, look at how often he goes right hand idea, left hand idea, and then the third one will be... That's going to show up in the, in the left hand. And then, together. So they actually come in sets of three very often. And they develop like that. Something here, something there. Now all of it together. Oh, cool. Start over. Something here, something there. All of it together. Cool. Start over. And so that contributes to the excitement of the narrative structure. But you see how simple it is. It's, it's almost funny. Okay, so check out those, those handle... Uh, the other one would be the G minor chaconne, which is just a circle of fifths pattern. So easy, okay? Uh, once, once you know those patterns, it's incredibly easy. Uh, so then after that, I said, all right, now let's start, let's really start messing around with like dance forms and allemands and uh, overtures and, uh, and then eventually onto fugue. Uh, which got a little more complicated. <laughs> but that's how, that's how I got into it. So you see, at every step, I do this thing called scaffolding, which is where when you're building something, you have to support it until it's ready to stand on its own. So you have all this scaffolding all around it, right, to hold it up so you can work on it. And when it's initially being worked on, it's covered in scaffolding so nobody can see it. So it's not ready. But then when maybe part of it's ready, you can take away some of the scaffolding. And it's revealed. Ah, it's a cool clock tower or something. Um, it's a statue of the Bowling Green mascot, which is, what is your mascot? It's falcon. A falcon. Okay, great, a falcon. Um, and then uh, uh, more and more can be taken away. And maybe at some point that structure doesn't need any. But variations with a repeated chord progression, that's scaffolding. So that's always there in place. So sometimes you just leave things. Uh, so to, to answer your question, never go out in front of them unless you know exactly how much scaffolding you need. And don't be afraid to use scaffolding. Some things uh, are already uh, put in stone, like a chord progression, a harmonic progression, a bass line, fugue subject. Other things can be made up in real time. Uh, so it's not a risk. Honestly, it's not a risk. I'm not guessing. I'm not rolling the dice. And, and honestly, we talked about this earlier, my colleague and I. I feel less like I'm going to get lost in the woods in my wanderings. I feel like there's a greater chance that something might happen with those train tracks. If you tell me you need 120 minutes of memorized virtuosic music and you need to remember every darn note. Okay, well... I'm, I'm okay as a concert pianist. I, I can do a lot. But year after year after year after year after year, sooner or later, something's going to drop. Sooner or later, I'm going to forget something. But when I'm improvising, if I get a little lost, I go, oh, this is a part where we modulate. And we just make up something else. So it's actually fine. <laughs>